Jarrell is in the development and now ready for commercial sale of a process that we have been working on for a number of years. Our objective was to develop hepatic artificial constructs for human and preclinical animal species that will address what we believe are a number of issues of importance to the industry. Facilitate characterization of hepatic drug disposition for low clearance compounds where traditional hepatocyte and microsome studies are limited by time viability constraint, constraints. Allow comparison of cross animal species and human hepatic drug disposition prior to in vivo studies. Permit both qualitative and quantitative identification and evaluation of form metabolites in preclinical species and humans. Confirm IV, IVC in preclinical small and large animal species as well as in humans in terms of hepatic clearance. Provide data to justify early elimination of inappropriate preclinical species and to be responsive to the concerns of the regulatory agencies, uh, the society and the industry in reducing the extent of animal testing and drug development. And so today's presentation will address drug clearance and metabolite formation in hepatic co-cultures developed by Hurel using primary hepatocytes from human, dog, and rat. And here are pictures of them from the microscope. So our goal is to be able to keep these co-cultures working for a significant period of time at a maximum ability to be able to measure the clearance of low to measure the elimination of low clearance compounds. And here we're looking at the rat hepatocyte co-culture on day two and day 14. Monocultures, a single culture, basically has been successful, but as you can see in this slide, starts to lose its viability about after day three. Where co-cultures, and here's two examples with two different stromal hepatocyte co-cultures, stromal one and stromal two, we continue in terms of the Hurel process to be able to stabilize these for seven to 14 and possibly longer than 14 days. Here's some data from our PNAS publication in 2009 looking at a number of different compounds and looking at the IV in vitro clearance, in vivo clearance prediction from these compounds, relatively low clearance to high clearance, antipyrene, buspyrone, sildenafil, metoprolol, timolol, carbamazepine. Here's the Jurel dog co-culture in looking in the microscope at day seven and day 14. And here's the Hurel human uh, standard culture media at day four and our Hurel platinum heps culture media at day four. What I'm gonna show now is a series of slides looking at the gene expression compared to monoculture hepatocytes and of course suspensions uh, for variety of enzymes. Here's cytochrome P453A4 on the left and what you can see versus the monoculture uh, is that it starts to decline after about day five to day eight. And you will see that the Hurel co-cultures begin to become stable, some systems about day five, other systems about day eight uh, for the various enzymes and transporters that we look at. Here's uh, cytochrome P452C19 on the left and uh, UGT on the right. Here is MRP3 uh, on the left. And again, the purple is the uh, monoculture and the blue is the co-culture and NTCP on the right. Here's pictures of biocannuliculi staining, which we begin to see at about day six, both in the human and in the dog co-culture. Now we're not at a point yet where we can see elimination or uh, biliary elimination of these compounds. These are more just a measure of cell viability in these hepatocyte cultures over time, but we are working uh, in that direction also in terms of being able to look at the drug in the bile. One of our issues were that since we're going to be commercial and presenting a variety of different systems, we need to have 
uh, multi-lot stability and reproducibility. And I'm going to show you a series of slides here just with three different cultures uh, in blue, red, and green, nothing specific about any of them, showing in general we're seeing the same capability from these co-cultures in the cell system, looking on day one as a control, just setting it as equal to one, and then going down as we see initially, but by day five to eight coming back up and then essentially maintaining uh, viability and constant clearance over time. That's buspirone, uh, it's CYP3A4. Here's sildenafil, CYP3A4, if you're seeing sort of the same picture. Here's a mipramine clearance with CYP3A4. Early in the development, uh, we wanted to look and see how good we would be at slow clearing compounds and in looking at drug rank ordering. Uh, the Urel, those of you that are familiar with Urel in the past, actually, we have worked with uh, major pharma partners in terms of looking at various molecules that they are interested in, and this was uh, one of the issues that one of our partners wanted us to do. And so we're looking at some very low in vivo uh, human clearances, diazepam, rosiglitazone, uh, and then some low clearance compounds, lorazepam, chlor chloramphenamine, and getting not perfect, but good uh, rank watering. And this data is about five years old now. One of the other issues that we want to be able to do is to generate metabolites, or at least to look at metabolite formation and the kinetics of metabolite formation. Here again are the three different co-cultures looking at the 5-hydroxy metabolite of imiprazole formed by cytochrome P452C19 over that three-week period that we've looked at the stability of the co-cultures uh, for the other uh, drug metabolism substrates. Here is acetaminophen formation. This is looking at phenacetin as the initial compound and then looking at 1A2 uh, metabolism of phenacetin to acetaminophen, again with the three different co-cultures over a 21-day period. And here's 7-hydroxywarfarin formation from 2C9, again over the same 21-day uh, period through the three different co-culture systems. So one of the things we want to do is to be able to look at these drugs in across humans and animal species. Up till the present time, we have the rat and the dog, but we are working on the monkey. Uh, and probably we'll go to the mouse, although I may be speaking out of turn here. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn, I was just told. So. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is a relatively low clearance compound in humans, uh, lorazepam, in the uh, metabolite generation in the Curel human system with very little metabolism at two hours, two days, still quite low metabolism, and we're seeing at seven days, 66%. In contrast, here's ketoprofen in these uh, cell system, in the Urel system, uh, where by two days we've got a lot of metabolism as compared to what we saw with lorazepam, and we're still seeing further metabolism at seven days. Now, let's look at that lorazepam compared with the dog. I showed the human data where the turnover is actually quite low. Lorazepam turnover in the dog is quite high. And you see at four hours, we've got 85% metabolism. And this corresponds very well with the dog human plasma clearance of lorazepam as 1.21 mils per minute per kilogram, and the dog at 18.6 mils per minute per kilogram. I showed you previously the ketoprofen in humans. Now look at the ketoprofen in dogs. The clearance of ketoprofen in humans and dogs is just about the same. And you can see that the turnover in the cell systems is just about the same for uh, looking at Jurel dog and Jurel human. This is looking at 4-hydroxytalbutamide. So one of the projects we've been pursuing in the last few months is to look at drug compounds where we know the metabolism is different in humans 
than in one of the animal species or both of the animal species. So here's tolbutamide uh, in rat metabolized with 2C11 in humans in 2C9, but in dog really almost nothing, minor metabolism. And you're looking at the 4-hydroxy tolbutamide concentrations over on the left-hand side, green is the rat, uh, blue is the human, and you see a little bit of the dog. And on the right-hand side, you're looking at the formation rate. The human rate, rate of formation is about double that of the rat over the five, first five days, with the dog producing mere traces of the metabolite, starting off with a starting concentration of 20 micromolar. Here's another example, sulfamethazine, again, where the dog is the outlier. Uh, on the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, the metabolite and acetyl sulfamethazine concentrations. The human in blue, the dog, the rat in green, and the dog in uh, red. Uh, re dogs reportedly had no acetyl transferase, but we are in vitro seeing some traces of metabolite suggesting there may be a small amount of enzyme. And on the right-hand side, looking at the formation rate in the three different species. Now we're going to look at uh, coumarin metabolism, both for the 7-hydroxy uh, coumarin, the primary metabolite, and then the conjugates, the sulfate conjugate and the glucuronide conjugate uh, from the coumarin. So what we're looking at in the top is the 7 hydroxy coumarin concentrations. And you can see that they're present in humans, but not at very high concentrations, and almost imperceptible, or all imperceptible in dog and rat in 7-hydroxy concentrations. There appears to be some sequential metabolism to the sulfate conjugate, but if you look at the y-axis on the lower left, you can see those numbers are very low compared to the glucuronide formation in humans. So here we're looking at 7-hydroxyglucuronide formation, 7 hydroxy coumarin glucuronide formation, which is really fairly unique to humans and not seen in the dog and the rat, as we show here in these systems. So that's where we are today with a static system, but what we're in the process of trying to do is to develop, or we're close to developing, a flow system and have talked about this flow system, uh, believing that flow is going to be important, and I think particularly for high clearance compounds where your rate limiting step starts to approach flow. And so some preliminary data, looking here at the Urel flow system in the lower right uh, versus a monoculture static, uh, obviously some better increase. Uh, you see the Urel human static. But notice in the Urel human static that although the uh, in vivo clearances are all going to be the same, you're shifted over to the left in the in vitro. You still get a pretty good correlation. It's probably a workable correlation, but as I would suspect, when we get the high clearance compounds, flow is gonna be more important in terms of getting a whole series of compounds on the line. Uh, here's the ability to generate metabolites in the flow system, which we would expect to be better, again, because you're flowing the metabolite away from the enzyme. Uh, and the uh, same kind of thing that when you do, you, see very see, you don't see much sequential metabolism when you're looking at hepatocytes or microsomes because the drug molecule is overwhelming uh, the metabolites to get sequential metabolism, but if you could flow them, sort of mimicking what happens in the body, you will have a better chance of seeing sequential metabolism and also, I believe, increased clearance, uh, increased metabolite formation. So this is where we are and what I've tried to show you in some conclusions, but more on perspectives of what we think uh, we can accomplish. The IVIVC in small and large animals, uh, we think we are able to show it as well as a human with a unique ability to characterize low clearance compounds. Less animal consumptive than live animal studies, uh, also less expensive. Improved selection of animal testing species, more insight into which species best correlate or fail to correlate with human hepatic uh, disposition. 
animal to human in vitro comparison may offer weight of evidence interpretation of questionable results derived from preclinical animal studies. I think it's valuable to know prior to dosing in vivo in the animals or humans, what animal species is going to make similar metabolism to the kinds of species you're gonna see in humans. And it opens the pathway for application-specific studies where FDA may, in the future, substitute cell-based tests for animal tests because just as society puts pressure on the industry in terms of animal testing, society also puts test pressure on the FDA. And I believe this is an important step in the pathway of reducing animal tests and replacing them with in vitro cell-based tests. Just as a final comment, you may not know that PETA has a scientific award. And Jurel won PETA's Outstanding Scientific Progress Award in 2010. And in a recent funding, the, um, uh, the Humane Society has, has an investment uh, arm, and the Humane Society puts some investment into Jurel, believing that this has a potential for future decrease in animal use. Thank you very much for your attention.